Good morning, church. How y'all doing this morning? So glad you guys decided to join us. Would y'all stand up, greet some people around you, and then we're going to begin to worship together. Survive! 
Cause I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you Cause I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you This is what happened You called my name today I had the amazing opportunity to say we are celebrating that day with some people today so turn your attention to the baptistry Layla Hanlon and her mom, Amy, and Layla's a fifth grader, and she's been really excited about this day. She's been praying about it for a long time, so today her mom's going to get to baptize her. So Layla, if you'll repeat after me, I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ. The, Son of the, God, the Son of the living God, and I accept him, I accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. Right, because of this, your confession, your mom's going to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit.
Good morning. What a glorious day for these families. Amen. You're going to have to do it. <laughs> this is Rachel G. I've known her for a long time. She takes care of my dog, my home, and she asked me to do this. Take on it. I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> so I'm going to let Tiffany do that part. Okay. Sarah, ready? You can repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord and Savior. All right. Because of your confession, Sabrina is going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Right, that's how we get things started. The kingdom's table just got a little bit bigger. We just had to add two more chairs. Now, I have no biblical proof of what I'm going to proclaim here in the next five seconds, but I think Jesus was a person all about Thanksgiving. This would have been his holiday. Because if you read scripture, he's all about gathering around the table and having some food. And I think if football was back then, he would have been a football fan as well. So Thanksgiving, if you ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, what's your favorite holiday? He would say Thanksgiving. And if you look at the Last Supper, the meal of the meals when it comes to Jesus Christ, man, who's there? We read about this, and I think we, we sometimes forget all 12, not just the 11, but all 12 of his disciples are there partaking sharing in a meal. And we know that one, uh, Judas. So many times I look at the 12, I told myself I wasn't gonna cry. <laughs> and it's like, man, I don't wanna be him. God, of, of all the 12, I don't wanna be him. He lied, he stole, he cheated, he backstabbed Jesus. And for what? Some change? I mean, he had to know Jesus was everything that Jesus said he was going to be. He saw the miracles. He heard the parables. He walked with this man like, gosh. But yet, Jesus wasn't living up to the standard that he had in his head for who Jesus needed to be. And still, though, Jesus had a seat at the table for him. I wonder how many of us would be able to say, the person who's stabbing me in the back, the person who's gonna turn away from me, the person who is betraying me, this Thanksgiving meal has a seat at my table. The Last Supper, the painting, the infamous painting is mag magnificent. Everything in it's perfect. You can run lines of straight across and up and down, and Jesus is the center focus point of everything. Everything is picture perfect, no pun intended, except one thing. There's a container of salt that's spilt over on the table. Nothing else on the table is out of place except this one thing of salt. And scholars and biblical uh, experts wonder and ponder about this, and I think it is the conclusion that Jesus asked us to be the salt. You put salt on anything and it adds flavor, even the things that we don't want to consume or eat. And then I think about Judas. And not only Jesus invited him, not only did Jesus prepare, but he says, hey man, this is your seat. And maybe even took some salt and put on his food. So as we partake, we are not worthy. <laughs> We are not worthy of a seat at his table. But every single one of us, not just those who have been baptized, every single one of us are invited to have a seat at his table. For you to walk up and Jesus say, hey, sit here next to me. 
and I'll put some salt on your food and I'll show you what love is. During this Thanksgiving break or Thanksgiving season and definitely during the meal, man, I want to challenge you. Who's the Judas in your life? And will you invite them? Man, that's going to be hard. <laughs> that's going to be really hard. But will you invite them to your meal? Will you invite them to sit at your table? Not the kids' table, your table. And to sit next to you. And can you love them? As Christ has loved us. That's what we need to remember. Heavenly Father, God, I look at the 12 and, man, I want to be Peter. I want to be John. But I'm Judas. So many times I take my eyes off you. We take our eyes off you. We want you to be who we want you to be. You're not to our standard. You're not to our code. You're not doing life the way we want it to be. But yet we want to be at your table. God, you're asking us to be salt in a world that just doesn't taste right. You're asking us to be salt to those we don't see eye to eye with. And quite honestly, you're asking us to be salt to those we just don't care for. For their words, for their actions, for their demeanor. So what we feel they have traded us in for. At this time, may we be reminded of what your son was traded in for. And that we have a seat at your table. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
everything in us we sing your praise because your name alone is worthy it's worthy of all glory all honor and all praise forever so God we're here we're open to what you have to say to us today would you show up Holy Spirit, would you show up in ways that we can't even ask or imagine? Because that's say what you say you do. God, we're here. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 Wow, man, what an awesome day. What an awesome day. Congratulations, guys. That is so, so awesome to be able to sit and to see uh, new sisters. Uh, in the kingdom and to listen to you guys sing. Uh, do y'all ever pay attention to that? Like I just get caught up sometimes. I can't sing. I'm too busy listening to you all sing. And uh, that is such a, such a cool, cool thing. Like we, Bradley was talking about, you know, we're, we're entering into this new season, right? We're entering into, not new, and we've done it every year, but it's, it's new this year, right? It's, it's the it's this season that we kind of look forward to every year. I mean, kind of from here on out, it's kind of like 
food is going to be amazing, right? And then come, you know, six weeks from now, gym memberships go through the roof. Yeah, and it all goes together. It all goes together. But it, it, it's kind of what this, this time of year that we can get really excited about because of all the energy and the things. And you can just take a second right now. I just want you to take like literally like five seconds and in your mind think, what is your favorite part of the next six weeks of the year? You got it? It, it, everybody's got some some of them are similar we can all like divide into groups so like who's this like I'm the lights guy like you know I would be like Clark Griswold on steroids if I had enough lights I mean I, I that's my thing I love that you know but we all get these we all get these things that we like about this season Thanksgiving and Christmas but then if we're really honest there's probably some stuff we don't like in fact, every year, while there's some people that like get so pumped up, jacked up about, I can't wait. They, some of you guys like are insane and like put your Christmas trees up like right after Labor Day. I mean, that's a, that's a clinical problem if that's okay. But you know, I'll give you Thanksgiving, but it, you know, some of you really are like, look that excited about it. And you may be sitting next to someone who dreads this season every year. Because this season for them brings back either horrific memories or it, this year is going to be especially tough because somebody they care about is not going to be around. And, and so there's this, there's this dichotomy, there's this mixture of emotions and feelings and what people are going through during the very same time each year. One of the things that is a dread for me is the consumerism. We live in a materialistic world. I mean, it's all about it getting bigger, better, nicer, and I'm all for that. But materialism can kind of take over pretty quickly. Money represents comfort and security and all, all those things that are good, but it can take over pretty quickly. I'm not saying it's wrong to save for the future. I've been trying to do that. I'm not wrong to buy nice things or take a dream vacation. That's all important, but as Christians, we ought to be distinctive about how we manage our things. We ought to be distinctive about how we make our money and manage our money, how we spend our money, how we save our money, and how we sometimes give it away. Jesus talked about what it looked like for Christians to live that kind of lifestyle. I, I, I picked out three different things that Jesus said. They're going to be on the screen right here behind me. Look at these things, and let's read them together, okay? These are all quotes straight from Jesus. Beware of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Second thing he said, freely you have received, freely give. Third thing, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We've heard that, but let's, can we be, just be honest in here? We kind of struggle with that a lot, don't we? It, it sounds good on paper. It, it kind of can make you feel guilty when you know it came from the mouth of Jesus, but we want to do it, but yeah, I don't know. I kind of like receiving. I kind of like receiving more than giving most of the time. And, that, and that's, that's where we are in the rest. So for the next three weeks, what we want to talk about, not necessarily money, what we want to talk about, all the money will be a part of it, what we want to talk about is generosity. And we've, we've titled this series, From Wall Street to Your Street. And, and truthfully, that may not be an appealing subject to some because they don't like to hear about it because Wall Street represents what? Wall Street represents wealth. It represents unimaginable wealth. And when things are good, it is awesome. And I mean, right now, it is, you know, hard for me to believe, but right now, that line is still going up and to the right. And it's kind of, it's, it's, everybody's happy, uh, at least in the financial world, when, they're, when that line is going up and to the right on the graph. But in, on Wall Street, what can happen? That line can plummet down and to the right, like in a 24-hour period, can it? Some of you have experienced that before, right? And we don't really want to experience it again because Wall Street, while it, it represents all this wealth, it is so uncertain. Now, as a church, 
As a church, we don't talk a lot about money. If you're new here, ask some of the vets. We don't, we don't talk a lot about money, especially not from a pressure of giving standpoint. In fact, if, you, if you're new here, you notice we haven't passed an offering plate yet today, and we're not going to. We just trust people to give online or in the boxes that are around the side because giving is part of who we are. But it doesn't, it's not about a pressure thing. I have no idea what anybody gives other than my family. And since Kim writes the check, sometimes I don't even know what we give. All right? It's not about that number. But here's what I do know. The Bible makes all kinds of promises to those who are generous with their time and with their talent and with their treasure. And so it would be foolish not to talk about those things. Listen to what the Bible says. In, in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will be himself refreshed. And then in Proverbs 19, verse 17, here's what it says. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward him for what he has done. And then in the New Testament, Paul writing to his young disciple, Timothy, who is going to be a church leader, says, for they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. One of the most classic passages in all of Scripture about how important it is to give is in the Old Testament book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And it's the prophet Malachi speaking for God. And here's what God says. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Go ahead. It's kind of like this. I love it. So this is like the Clint Eastwood verse of the Bible. Go ahead. Try me. You know, make your move. Test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you'll not have room enough for it. Now, just being real and, and getting this out on the table, and out of the way, a tithe is 10%. And biblically, historically, that's what a, a tithe is, 10%. God says, you give me a tithe, and I will bless you and bless you and bless you some more, but not just of money, of your time, of your talent. Jesus talked about, there's a passage in the New Testament where Jesus actually talks about them giving of their spices, of the different things they have. Whatever you have, just give it, give God 10% of it, and see what he will do. It's so much more than just tithing, though, guys. We've got to understand that. It's really the principle we've got to dig into. It's all all about generosity because because get this I you know if you don't get anything else in the next three weeks I hope you get this this idea that generosity is one of the keys to a full and abundant life generosity is that important and if God promises to bless the generous how can we not talk about that so here's what I want to do if you got a Bible I want you to open up the book of 2 Corinthians it's about, uh, I don't know, two-thirds of the way through the New Testament. Uh, when you find 1 Corinthians, guess what? Second one is next, okay? All right? Uh, and so go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, all right? And hang on there. We're going to talk about all of chapter 8 and half of chapter 9 over the next three weeks. So we'll kind of go half a chapter a week, all right? And what I really hope it, this does is fan the, flame, fan the flames of generosity in our church but even beyond that, in our community, and that we can really become the kind of generous people I think God calls us to be. And when we get our brains around that, I'm, I'm convinced great things are really going to start to happen. So today, in the first half of chapter 8, I want to walk you through, and we're going to see four things that make generosity a great way to live. Uh, and I, I really do believe if you, if you pay attention and dig into this, it can change your life and in turn change the lives of others, change the world. Let me give you some real quick background about 2 Corinthians. Paul is the writer of 2 Corinthians. He's writing this, this book or this letter actually is what it was. He's writing a letter to the Christians in Corinth. Uh, it's a prominent city in Greece. And, and at times, Paul visited Corinth, and at other times, he just wrote them letters. So in this section of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the collection that was being taken for the Christians in Jerusalem. See, the New Testament, this is, this is what makes it really cool. The New Testament church was born in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem Christian Church was it was the first one okay it was uh, like the mothership okay all right it all started there but now what we're seeing here is Paul talking about how these other churches have now gotten on their feet and going and they're actually taking a collection to help the Christians that are at the church that started their church it's kind of a cool concept uh, of giving back in that way okay and, and so he goes in here and then he starts in the beginning of verse 1 and teaches us that generosity kind of involves invites an extra level and it, God invites God's grace in in a huge way okay listen to verse 1 and now brothers we do not want you to know about the great we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches listen to this verse 2 is just amazing we're, we're gonna be a lot here today out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty now when I read that, I kind of like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, we got, okay, trial, you know, trial, joy, poverty. All right? You, you see how it's going to be? Out of all of that, they were able to give. Their, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond what their ability was entirely on their own. And they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So here's what you got. They pleaded for the privilege of giving. Now, over the last two decades, three, four decades, I don't know, whenever televangelists started going crazy and nuts, Preachers have gotten a bad rap, haven't we? I mean, this is, my, this is my pity party. Preachers have got a bad rap about asking for money. All right, and all they're, all they're doing over there, we're not going to watch that or we're not going to go there because all they're doing is begging for money. And it's kind of all goes back to all that scams and all those scandals. But did you catch what he's, Paul was saying here? He's like, it wasn't the preacher. It was the church. That was begging, oh, please let us give, please let us give, please let us give, please let us give more. Can we give more? Can you imagine going into a setting like that? But that's exactly what was going on. He's like, they were begging us. They were begging us, and he was telling the Corinthian Christians about the Macedonian Christians who were helping the Jerusalem Christians. They couldn't afford to give, but they couldn't live with themselves if they didn't give. And then he goes on to tell them about their amazing generosity, that God's grace and their generosity went hand in hand. It, it kind of sounds like when you read it, that God gave them a little extra grace because of how they gave to others. But, but be very careful there, be very careful of that. We're not talking here about saving grace because those are two different things here, right? Because Paul said, Paul's not saying that they earned heaven because they gave money. That, that's, that's false teaching, all right? But, but there is, by its very definition, grace is unmerited favor. It's a blessing is unearned and undeserved. But God did say that he poured out blessings on them because they understood their saving grace and that made them pour out grace on others because of what they had received themselves. Think of it this way. Parents, parents, isn't it easier to do really nice things for your kids when they're walking in step with your family plan and design? I, I, I mean, you know, we start off when they're really little and one of the first things we teach them is first time obedience. You know, like as soon as mom or dad says this, you need to do this, you need to respond this way. And when they're doing that, you're like, oh, way to go, way to go. Or, or when they're cleaning their room or doing whatever chores you have, they're doing good in school, they're not being disrespectful, they're not being defiant. You don't love them anymore, I hope, when they're doing that. But because of that, it's easier to bless them when they are walking in stride with what you have asked them to do, isn't it? It's just more exciting. In fact, it's somewhat foolish if they're walking out of stride to bless them as if they were walking in stride. And so God is saying here, he's like, it's not about them receiving grace, but because they receive grace, I can give them even more blessing because they're walking in stride with what I've asked them to do and being generous in everything that they do. A generous spirit on our part invites the favor of God into our lives. The second thing is that generosity offers an expression of joy. All right? I want to go back and read verses 2 and 3 again. Uh, they're amazing to me. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. 
If you just said that about something going on in our world today, people would say you had lost your mind. Because those things don't typically go together. You know, trials, uh, poverty, generosity, they, they don't go together. But he says, I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They didn't get, listen, these guys, they did not give because of their trials. And they certainly didn't give because of their poverty. Those things could have easily been barricades, you know, blocks to generosity. But because of their joy, they crashed through the barriers. They crashed through the blockades. And they gave generously. And in spite of the poverty, in spite of trials, they did so because of joy. It's kind of like I heard a story about a little kid who goes to the mall to see Santa Claus and he climbs up in the lap of the guy that's dressed up like Santa Claus. And the guy asks him, says, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And the little boy says, oh, that's easy. That's easy. I, I, I want two fire trucks. I want two remote control cars. I want two baseball clubs. And I want two kickballs. And the guy that's dressed up like Santa is like, like what? Why do you want two of everything? And, and he's kind of like, kind of like correcting the kid. Why do you want two of everything? And the boy looks at him and says, so I can share, of course. It's a lot easier to share when you got two of everything, isn't it? It's a lot easier to be generous when you've got two of everything. But, but the, what we're focusing today is because of the uncertainty, there's that intersection because of the uncertainty of this world and the things that we have, there's that intersection of generosity and uncertainty that, that creates conflict in our lives. How do we be generous when we maybe don't have as much or we're uncertain about what the future looks like? I got a letter this week, and with their permission, I, I want to read you the letter. It's from a family in our church. And I've removed their names and just uh, kind of used pronouns uh, uh, to describe them. But it fits perfect with this. Look, here's what the letter says. It said, my husband and I have been tithing for years now. I had always struggled with tithing because I didn't trust God's promise to provide our daily bread. Then in 2019, my husband got less than the cost of living raise, but I got a significant bump of about 10000 then on April 1st of 2020, my husband got laid off. He actually thought they were joking since it was April Fool's Day. And he remained unemployed until the end of October, so for about six months, of zero income from the primary breadwinner. Unemployment took forever due to all the massive layoffs and Kentucky unemployment uh, was unprepared for the unprecedented number of COVID filings. All that stuff was going on. I was able to support us financially on my income alone because of the fact that we had become debt free with the exception of our house. We didn't have to cancel our summer vacation, nor did we make any adjustments to our lifestyle due to us not having debt. And we never missed a mortgage payment. But here's the key. We never stopped tithing. And on top of that, we continued to support a small orphanage. Uh, we purchased a new or new to us ski boat. We traveled to Colorado for our 30th wedding anniversary to the Northwest for a Christmas vacation. And looking back on 2020, we really don't know how we were able to do all the things without his income. Somehow we managed because God provided. Then when my husband finally started his new job in October of 2020, he actually started at an income increase of 60% of what he was previously making. In the spring of 2021, I received another significant raise. And not only that, in September of this year, he was told he was receiving a 10% increase in pay, but it was actually more like 13%. So between 2019 and 2020, our income dropped well over $20,000. But due to God's blessing, our income in 2021 has more than doubled. And the year isn't over yet. Neither, are, neither of us are in sales. So this is not from commissions or bonuses. It's simply God's way to allow us to fund his kingdom and be his hands and feet here on earth. We have gone, I love this. We have gone from being afraid to tithe 
and giving with a fearful heart, not trusting in God's provision, we gave from a place of obligation and not, not joy to now giving generously. I, I recently had the opportunity to help a friend in need, joyfully sent funds. We had the opportunity to step up our giving to the place in Uganda. We purchased beds and bedding for six children in an orphanage. Um, we joyfully sent the funds, and these orphans had never slept in a bed before. And God is blessing us once again with an opportunity to purchase property that's out of state that we can use for retreats, for visits. We can donate a week of vacation time to raise funds for a worthy cause. The possibilities are endless as God's plans are for us. That's, that's not something that just like, you know, that's like real people who are members of our church that are living in a world now that understands generosity and how God's blessing is. But, but we actually talked this week, and said, you know, the part of the talk was, it's not always financial, but God will do what he says he'll do. He'll bless. Now, here's what I've had said to me before. I've had people sit in coffee shops and in restaurants and say this to me. Maybe you've said this, or maybe you didn't say it. You just thought it because you, like, you didn't want to hear the words come out of your mouth. All right? But I've had people look me in the eye and say, I can't afford to be generous right now, but when I have more, then I will be. I've been doing this for a long time, and I have an answer to that. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because if you can't be generous with a little, there ain't no way you're going to be generous with a lot. Because then those, you, those zeros start adding up and it's like, oh, oh my, I might need that later. Or let's, let's build my name and my kingdom. You know, generosity is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It doesn't come just when we have extra. Let's, let's keep moving, all right? Look, in, look back at the very end of verse 3, because I want us to see there, generosity also shows that we trust the Lord. He, at the very end of verse 3, it says, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. There's that begging, let's, let us give, let us give. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave of themselves first to the Lord. Underline that. They gave of themselves first to the Lord and then uh, to us in keeping with God's will. See, generosity reveals our relationship with Jesus. When our hearts belong to Christ, we're not so likely to cling on to the things of this world. See, it's easier to turn loose of things when your heart's in the right place. In fact, it's easier to turn loose of things you don't really have hold of. Listen to me. Here's two words that do not go together. A stingy Christian is a contradiction in terms. We, we would call it an oxymoron. It's kind of like jumbo shrimp. It don't go together. All right? Stingy Christian doesn't go together at all. You remember when Jesus was here on earth? I, I love just reading like life of Jesus, like lifestyle stuff that's going on, just, just doing everyday life. And he had friends, he had uh, the, uh, the disciples, he had three that was really close, Peter, James, and John. But then he had this family that if you've read very much in the New Testament, you know he's very close to. There's a guy named Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. In John chapter 11, there's the story that's told about Jesus being at their house and hanging out of their house. And it says that Mary went and got this really expensive jar of perfume and brought it out. And the Bible said, don't, don't, if you read through that, don't, don't miss what the Bible The Bible says it was this jar of perfume worth a year's wages. Now, in that day and time, a year's wages, what? but it's still a year's wages. All right, it still is. So just take just a second, just take just a second and think how much money, larger, how much money do you bring in in a year, in an entire year? And imagine having something in your house, house that is worth that much money. It's worth a year of what you currently make. And then the Bible says that Mary, out of her, out of her love for Jesus and who he was and his, or believing in him, she went and she got that jar of perfume, and it doesn't say that she opened it and poured a little bit on Jesus. There's another story about a lady doing that later on. No, it doesn't say that like she reached in, got her hand, and, and soaked her head and like rubbed it on. No, it doesn't say. The Bible says there that she broke the jar. Right? When you break the jar, there ain't no refilling the jar. You follow me? 
You know, it, it, she is all in at that moment. She is all in in her love, in her generosity, in her care. And people started to criticize her. Yeah, see, it's really easy to criticize somebody else's generosity. Because, but you know what that's really doing? That's covering up your lack of it. You know, I can't believe. I can't believe. You know, you know what we could have done for the poor with, the mo the, with that much? Well, then go do it. Don't criticize her. Jesus said, leave her alone because she has done a beautiful thing here. This woman was so overcome with love, so overwhelmed with devotion, so filled with gratitude that she didn't think twice about giving her most precious possession to the Lord. Now look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, so we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. And he's going back to Titus had been there and helped take up money that was going to help this other church. He said, and then he said this, but just as you excel in everything— in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in your love for us. Look, catch this. See also that you excel, that, that do really good, in the grace of giving. Just as you excel in everything else, excel in giving. You know, you know we talk a lot about excellence, or we try to, and, and we try. Our, our goal here is to do everything we can do with excellence. We talk a lot about serving, and for some people, their service, their, their greatest act of service is their giving. There's some people that just, like, I don't know who it is and what, but I see all of a sudden when, like, where did that money come from? And, and you know, our treasurer just says, just somebody gave big. Like, wow, that's big, big. Like, because it's like, we just jump like huge. And, and they excel in that. And it's awesome because while we try to do everything in excellence, we're human. And we work really hard at trying to do things right from starting on time, making sure the slides and the videos work, uh, how we do our music, the sermons, the lessons, printed materials, we proofread stuff. Inevitably, I can proofread something five times, and as soon as it goes public, I find something misspelled, and it just drives me crazy when that happens. But none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But excellence is always the goal. So what's Paul saying? You excel in everything else? Excel also in the grace of giving. And then there's one more thing I want us to see, and we'll be done. Look at verse 8, because it shows us that generosity shows our love. Paul said, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Here's, here's something really critically important. What Paul just said there, and what he's written in this whole letter, is written to Christians. This letter's not written to a non-believer. This, this teaching is not for non-believers. It's for those of us who say we believe. And these people, these, these are believers. These are people who have at least said that they're believers. They, 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 they've gone to pathways. They've gotten baptized. They got the shirt. They, they got the bumper stickers. They're, they're like, again, yeah. all right? And so he said, to you guys, remember this. Don't lose sight of this. Jesus had everything. And he gave up everything so that you and I can receive everything. That's the gospel. That's huge. Generosity proves the sincerity of our love. It's all about building community, reaching people for Jesus. And the cool thing is we don't even see it happening. We sing a song sometimes that talked about even when we don't see it, he's working. You know, there's this word in the Bible that, I, that, that came back across this week, and, and Kim and I were talking about this word in the Bible, and it was just the more we talked about it, the more examples we found about it, and it's just like we were getting pumped talking about this. And it's a word that is not necessarily a biblical word, not necessarily a spiritual word, it, you know, because there are those words that, like the only time you ever hear them or say them is in some kind of religious spiritual biblical context this isn't one of those words but it is in there and it's the word meanwhile meanwhile and it's like something else is going on over here but meanwhile and I love that because it's like you may not see him working but meanwhile 
Meanwhile, he's doing something. And in, in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, in the, verse, in the very first verse, Acts 9 starts off this way. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath. You know, Saul's getting all Christians together. He could, getting them up in packs and, and trying to arrest them or, or kill them. And, but meanwhile, God was moving to build his church. God's actually using this. <laughs> God's actually using the one that's trying to destroy the church is going to be the one that spreads the church the most. That's pretty cool. All right. Meanwhile, 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 Paul makes their, Saul makes his conversion to change the name. He's listening and learning and beginning to preach a little bit. But the person who's mentoring him, meanwhile, Peter is continuing to preach everywhere, including, guess what? To the Gentiles. And the gospel is being spread. I, we, were, we were talking about this, and we started th- thinking about Jesus sitting in the temple. Luke 21, verse 1. So the meanwhile, Jesus was in the temple, and he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box, walking up, bags of money, boom, drop, boom, drop. He wanted to show and brag about how much they were given. And then verse 2 said, a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. Jesus looks at his disciples and said, did you guys see that? Did you see that? They're put on a show. Meanwhile, look, did you see that? This this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they gave out of the part, they gave out a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given what? Everything she has. She wasn't giving out of her abundance. She was giving out of her love. Listen, here, get this. Tweet this, write this down. Get this picture that's about to come on the screen. You need to understand this. You can give without loving. People do it all the time. You just watch. For the next six weeks, there's going to be a lot of giving going on. And a lot of it's with love, but a lot of it has nothing to do with loving. You know what a lot of the giving this time of year has to do with? Tax deductions. That's just being real. There ain't no love in it all except self-love. And you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And the more you trust Jesus, the easier it is to let go of everything. And Paul goes on. Let me finish this uh, section up. Paul goes on and gives us this, uh, this generosity in a summary here. Look at verse 13. Our, best, or our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. For at the present time, you're plenty. You're doing good. You're plenty. You're extra. We'll supri- supply what they need. So that in turn, when the rules, when the shoe's on the other foot, their plenty will supply what you need. And there will be equality then. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. It's all about generosity. It's a give and take venture. And generosity invites God's grace and offers an expression of joy. It shows that we trust the Lord. It proves our love of the Lord. And the more you trust in Jesus the easier it is to let go of everything. One of the most dramatic movies I've ever seen came out in 1994. It was a true movie about a guy named Oscar Schindler. He was a German businessman who made a fortune, an absolute fortune, during World War II by running Jewish-operated businesses. And his sole interest in the very beginning was plain and simple, to make money, lots and lots of money. But something happened. He realized the complete wickedness and evilness of the Nazis and the danger that his Jewish workers were in. And so Oscar Schindler spent his fortune trying to save them. He bribed Nazi officials to allow to keep his workers in the factory instead of sending them to Auschwitz. But even while they were working, they were sabotaging the theory things they were making so that the Germans couldn't use them. And his Jewish accountant finally poured over Schindler's business records. He found this long list of Jewish workers. And he stares at it. There's a point in the movie. He stares at it in disbelief. And he says, how did you convince the Nazis to let all these workers stay here? And he pauses. He says, you bribed them, didn't you? You bought these people. He looked at the list in his hand. He said, this isn't a list. It's a life. Over 1,100 people were saved by Oscar Schindler. 
And the war is over, and the ironic thing was he then becomes the criminal and is forced to flee for his life because uh, he worked with the Nazis to keep the factory open, even though he was sabotaging the stuff. But he's still now wanted for these crimes of war and has to flee. And there's this great scene at the end of the movie when Schindler's saying goodbye to his Jewish workers. He's overwhelmed by all that happened, but with all that might have been. I want you to watch this scene for just a moment as we close. This car was 10 people. This, this button's two people. You know, we can all look back with regret in life and easy to look back and I could have done more. And the truth is we all could have. But I don't think that's really the point. Looking back, asking what might have been, that's not the point. I think what we've got to take out of here is what am I doing right now? What am I doing right now at this intersection of generosity and uncertainty? And understanding that the more we trust in Jesus, the easier it is to let go of everything. But really, the only way that we can have that attitude is to really make room for Jesus in our life. Surrender everything. Lay it all down. Put it all down. So while we do this last song, Lights are going to come back down. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm just going to ask you, once again, we've done this before, but these are personal times. These are real times. Just what do you need to surrender to be living a life of generosity? 
And if you do need to talk to someone about something, Jason will be down here at the front. We've got elders and myself, others around the room, but let's just make room. Let's just make room to be generous this year. And here is where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lion. This is my surrender And I will make room for you To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to And I will make room for you To do whatever you want
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. God, we give it all to you. We give it all to you in the powerful name of Jesus. Help this to be a year of generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, there's angel tree. Uh, there's just a few more angels out there. There's only about five spots uh, left for bell ringers, so sign up for those. There are some leaves on a table back there. We did this at our Thanksgiving meal last week. Uh, and just You can take a leaf and write something you're thankful for, and I'm headed back, and we're going to staple more of them to our thankful tree uh, that's back there in the corner. Uh, and then as you leave, start inviting people to Christmas, and we got a way for you to do that. we got these bumper stickers, and we've got a special website, Christmas at scc.org, just like the one we had at Easter, and it tells everything Christmas, all right, uh, that's going on here. So start leading people to that. Get them, put them on your car. And the best thing about them, I don't know how they do them, but they're the kind that they don't like stay. Like you can then just peel them right off and they don't tear up your window or your paint or anything like that. So you can put them on after Christmas, take them off. But for the next month, you can invite people to what God is doing here. Thanks a lot, guys. Let's do our thing. Let's go love God, love people. Let's go change the world. See you guys.